Welcome to Menachem United Methodist Church online service on Sunday, December the 13th, in the year of the Lord, 2020. We welcome you in the name of the Lord, Jesus Christ, our Savior. We are glad that you are here with us as we unite our hearts and minds to worship our Heavenly King. May the Lord bless all of us throughout this worship service. within our human family. Bring us now, at longest last, the forgotten joy of God's good presence. Lighten our heavy loads that you may cradle only you, a burden that lightens our hearts with heavenly joy. Call to worship. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. And also with you. The risen Christ is with us. Praise our opening hymn today is hymn number 234, of United Methodist Hymnal, O Come, All Ye Faithful. We are going to sing the first two verses. children's time. Hi guys, I'm going to show you nativity scene in our church. Someone uh, did a beautiful decoration of this nativity scene. It only appears once a year around Christmas time as you could imagine. And I'm going to come closer. Maybe I can zoom. Maybe that's the way it is. Okay. Now, what do we see here? Who do we see here on this Christmas nativity set? Yes, I see clearly three wise men. Some people call them magi. Have you noticed that all of them holding gifts to the newborn king? Okay, let's move the camera. We also see... Mary, the mother of Jesus. Okay, let me take back. I think we see the stable, right? And zoom back again. 
we see Ma Mary, the mother of Jesus. And the gentleman standing, his name is Joseph. He's holding a lantern. Okay. Uh, maybe Jesus is not there. Okay, I noticed. And we see angel. And I see an ox and donkey and baby sheep and shepherd. That's good. Now let me take back a little bit. All right, there we go. Now, have you noticed that? What's missing here? Yeah, yeah, yes, everyone knows that. Baby Jesus is not there. So may I say, would you agree with me if I say, Without Jesus in this nativity set, the whole thing doesn't mean a thing. Without Christ in Christmas, Christ Christmas is never complete either. You know, there are some folks out there who celebrate Christmas as a you know, time to exchange their gifts and toys and a lot of things. But what good is it? You can talk all about gifts from the three wise men. You can talk about all this beautiful thing in heavens, angels. You can talk about cute story of, you know, shepherds bringing the, uh, all the animals to worship the newborn king. But without Christ, it means nothing. I think whoever set this uh, nativity set has the point. Without Christ, Christmas, is never complete. Okay? I want you to remember, as you celebrate the season of Christmas, who is the center of this whole story of Christmas? Jesus, the baby Jesus born as king. Okay? See you next time. Prayer of Confession and the Assurance of Pardon. Gracious and merciful Father, we come before you in humility and adoration. You have called us to be partakers of your holiness. We are truly sorry that we have not walked worthy of your calling. Have mercy on us and forgive us. Our Father in heaven has mercy on you and forgives all your sins through Jesus Christ, his only Son. Amen. Today we have a special music by Ruth Axel and Edna Winans. May the Lord bless all of us as we join their praise of our heavenly King.
Today's scripture is coming from the Gospel according to Luke, chapter 1, verses 5 through 25. In the days of Herod, king of Judea, there was a priest named Zechariah of the division of Abijah, and he had a wife from the daughters of Aaron, and her name was Elizabeth. They were both righteous in the sight of God, walking blamelessly in all the commandments and requirements of the Lord. And yet they had no child, because Elizabeth was infantile, and they were both advanced in years. Now it happened that while he was performing his priestly service before God in the appointed order of his division, According to the custom of the priestly office, he was chosen by lot to enter the temple of the Lord and burn incense. And the whole multitude of the people were in prayer outside at the hour of the incense offering. Now an angel of the Lord appeared to him, standing to the right of the altar of incense. Zechariah was troubled when he saw the angel, and fear gripped him. But the angel said to him, do not be afraid, Zechariah, for your prayer has been heard, and your wife Elizabeth will bear you a son, and you shall name him John. You will have joy and gladness, and many will rejoice over his birth, for he will be great in the sight of the Lord, and he will drink no wine or liquor, and he will be filled with the Holy Spirit while still in his mother's womb. And he will turn many of the sons of Israel back to the Lord their God. And it is he who will go as a forerunner before him in the spirit and power of Elijah to turn the hearts of fathers back to their children and the disobedient to the attitude of righteous to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. Zechariah said to the angel, How will I know this? For I am an old man and my wife is advanced in her ears. The angel answered and said to him, I am Gabriel, who stands in the presence of God, and I was sent to speak to you and to bring you this good news. And behold, you will be silent and unable to speak until the day when these things take place, because you did not believe my words, which will be fulfilled at their proper time. And meanwhile, the people were waiting for Zechariah and wondering at his delay in the temple. But when he came out, he was unable to speak to them, and they realized that he had seen a vision in the temple, and he repeatedly made signs to them and remained speechless. When the days of his priestly service were concluded, he went back home. Now after these days, his wife Elizabeth became pregnant and she kept herself in seclusion for five months, saying, This is the way the Lord has dealt with me in the days when he looked with favor upon me to take away my disgrace among people. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Amen. Around this time of the year, Christmas season, we hear a lot about the greatest story of all, the birth of Christ in a manger, because there was no room in the inn, right? Did you know that Christ's birth story was recorded in two Gospels? There are four Gospels in the New Testament, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, but only two have the story of Christ's birth. Mark and John don't have it. Anyway, it's a great story, the manger story, isn't it? Under it, though, there's one story often buried and hidden. The story of another child whose name was John known to us as the Baptist. Yes, John the Baptist. In fact, I looked at my sermon record in the past 30 years, how often 
I preached on the story of John the Baptist as a baby. And I recall maybe once or twice I did. You see, so it's really rare, at least for me, to speak about the birth story of John. So please bear with me, that's what I'm going to do. I dig out his birth story from dust and about to uh, share with you because I believe it's worth looking into his birth story. I need to take you back to the very beginning of the Gospel according to Luke. Of course, it has 24 chapters, and I'm taking you to the first chapter. Luke, the writer, begins the Gospel, his account, as follows in chapter 1, verse 1. Since many have undertaken to compile an account of the things accomplished among us, just as they were handed down to us by those who from the beginning were witnesses and servants of the word, in other words, so many hundreds of witnesses and servants of the word means the apostles. Verse 3, he says, it seemed fitting to me as well. Having investigated everything carefully from the beginning, to write it out for you in an orderly sequence, most excellent Theophilus. In other words, Luke recorded the whole account as a letter or book, if you will, sent to the most excellent Theophilus. Okay? Verse 4, so that you may know the exact truth about the things you have been taught. Taught. When Luke wrote down 24 chapters of the gospel, there were not many gospels around. I mean, letters plenty, but no one really, you know, jotted down except Mark. Anyway, I just wanted to tell you who Luke was, the writer of the gospel according to Luke. He was a physician. As a physician, he was a very in other words, very meticulous, looking into details and try to not make any mistakes. You could imagine surgeon or physician cut someone's hand, you know, just finger, whatever hand. Oops, I made a mistake. You can't do it, right? So as a medical doctor, he was a very thorough person. So before he wrote down the account of Jesus' life and ministry in the Gospel according to Luke, he had carefully examined and investigated everything from the beginning. As he wrote, interviewing many eyewitnesses and apostles. And he compiled them all. And this goes here, this goes before this, and all these things. And finally he says, I'm ready to write down. Then he began the gospel with the story of a childless couple, husband and wife, Zechariah the husband and Elizabeth the wife. From their story, folks, this morning I am going to draw three spiritual lessons, if you will. They are, do not judge by the look. Number two, wait for God's time. Number three, align your perspective with God's value system. Do not judge by the look, wait for God's time, and align your perspective with God's value system. Now let's do the first one. Do not judge by the look. If you look at verse 6, it says this, They were, both meaning Zechariah and Elizabeth, husband and wife, they were both righteous in the sight of God, walking blamelessly in all the commandments and requirements of the Lord. Verse 7, and yet they had no child. Hmm. To this rather unknown married couple, the Bible gives a very high compliment. They were both righteous before God. Yet, problem was, they had no child. Hmm. Let me tell you, back in those days when a married woman failed to birth a child, 
folks in town, folks in the family would suspect that something was wrong with the wife first, isn't it? Woman first, and the husband, or both. Such understanding was deeply rooted in people's mentality that God blesses the righteous and vice versa. If you're good with God, God will bless you with so many things, including children. But if you're not so good, something's wrong with you, before God, God will not bless you. And that kind of mentality, to the point where if woman unable to bear a child, she thought it was a disgrace to herself and to the family, you see? Now, let me tell you the story of a man who was born blind. Actually, it is recorded in uh, John, Gospel of John, chapter 9, verse 1 and the following. One day, Jesus and his disciples walking on the streets, right, in Jerusalem. And they saw a man, grown a man, However, he was blind. What do you think he was doing on the street? He was begging for people to give something, like money. If you're born back then, you know, just blind, the only thing you could do is to support yourself. You just go to the streets and sit down and start begging to support yourself, right? Anyway, that's what they were, he was doing. So the disciples looked at this man and they asked Jesus, whose fault is this? that the man, the way he was born, right? Now listen to their actual words that he spoke, they spoke to Jesus. Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he would be born blind? You see, they're connecting something miserable or something, you know, just misfortunate happened to a man and there must be some reason behind. Was it because of their parents' sin or even the man's sin? Although it sounds very silly, the baby born with, you see? Anyway, and Jesus answered in verse 3, It was neither this man sinned nor his parents, but it was so that the works of God might be displayed in him. And Jesus says, no, 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 no. You may think that someone had sinned against God, so that's the consequences that this man, you know, pays. No. It's not his fault. It's not his parents' sin either. It is to the glory of God. Hmm. What Jesus is teaching us here is this. Do not judge anyone's misfortune or even yours, based on the outside look. Even though a person is very righteous before God, keeping all the commandments of God, the same person may lack in his or her life something we call blessings, such as wealth, health, or even children, or good job, you name it. Now keep in mind, someone's ill-fated life may have nothing to do with what you may think it is. Furthermore, you never know how their life will unfold later as the display of God's work. You see what I'm saying? Do not judge anyone's life by the outside that's the first lesson. The second lesson is this. Wait for God's time. If you look at verse 13, Gabriel, the angel, spoke to Zechariah saying, Your prayer has been heard. Hmm. For years, don't you think, Zechariah, the husband, had been praying for his wife to bear a child? I believe he had. It eventually came true. However, not at the time when they wanted, but at a much later time. At a time when they almost had given up on their hope of having a child. You see, here is a lesson for our prayer life. 
Although God says yes to your prayer request, it may take time to come true. So, learn to patiently wait for God's time. Because your prayers will be answered not in human time, we call chronos. That's where the English word chronological, chronology, coming from. Chronicles, all these things, right? God's prayers, you know, you will not be answered in human time, but what? In His time. The Bible calls it Kairos. Oh, by the way, a quick review on the types of answers to our prayers. There are three. Yes, no, and wait. It is relatively easy for me to explain the yeses and noes. I all experienced that. You did too. The tricky one is the waits. For instance, Zechariah and Elizabeth had to wait for a very, very long time to the point where they became old, beyond the childbearing age. The scripture does not specify how old they were, but Zechariah told the angel, I'm an old man, and my wife is advanced in her ears. I don't know when a man calls himself, I'm an old man. What do you think? How old? Typically. In my best judgment, Zechariah must be in his 40s or even 50s. Again, that's my best guess. So the point I'm making is that let us not give up on our prayers after praying only a couple of years. Consider Zechariah and his wife's case one more time, although it was clearly God's will for them to have a son, but the son had to be born in God's time, not in theirs. This is the way I understand. God created you know, everything and predestined everything, and he said, here, I'm going to let my son, son of God, born, be born on a certain time, right? That's the watershed moment before Christ and after Christ, right? So based upon that, and he says, who's going to be the mother of this, the Son of God? Oh, I have chosen, Mary will be, okay? And I'm going to send a messenger, okay, before the Son of God, and he's going to be, I'm going to make him be born, about six months prior to Christ, and I'll call him John. This is all God, you know, planned. And who's going to be John's parents? Oh, there is a godly people there, Zechariah and Elizabeth. They're a little older, but that's okay. Are you with me? So God planned and predestined and chose them to be the parents. But to accomplish and to fulfill God's plan for John to be born about six months before Christ was born, Elizabeth and Zechariah had to wait. Are you with me? Until that appointed time we call Kairos, God's time. You see, our human nature is that I want it now. I need it now. Our time is always now, now, now. And God says, no. My time is not yet. You see? Now, recently, I've been learning, and God has been training me to learn that wisdom. God's time is different from my time. And I have been pondering a word of God in Psalm 37, 5. It says, commit your way to the Lord and trust in him. Hmm. You see, like you do, I have some requests I've been praying for years, may I say? 30 years, 20 years, and some of them 40 years. Has not been fulfilled yet. Okay. I know that God has heard my prayer for sure, but I am learning to wait patiently for the answer with faith 
and trust in him, waiting for God's time. One thing is for sure, God knows what the best for me is. Okay? He knows what he's doing too. <laughs> you know, a story comes to my mind. God knows the best. Story of a captain, experienced, you know, very old yet experienced captain. He knows everything inside and out of that uh, strait, if you will, the, the Bay Area going in and going out. It was very treacherous area, one spot. So unless you're really careful, you may run the boat into the rock easily. Okay? So he was training this young aspiring you know, sailor who wants to be the captain in the future. Very good man, an excellent young man. So captain and this young you know, sailor standing, and the captain asked, why don't you take the, you know, this, uh, the rudder? So the, the young man uh, nervously, okay. Again, this is the training. And as they go through that very treacherous area, the captain said, reminded the young sailor, you know, wait until I said that you need to turn to the right, okay? And there's a rock standing, okay? So just don't turn until I said to do it. Young sailor said, yes, sir. And as they were going through and coming closer and the rock is coming nearer and nearer and the young man became really nervous. I think I need to turn now. And the captain says, not yet, not yet. And the young man, just his hands are like getting sweat all over and say, he was very nervous. Can I turn now? And the captain said, not yet. Wait until I said, do it. Okay. And a couple of seconds later, the captain says, do it now. And then the young man turned to the right. And it was good. You see, like that, we want to turn in. We want it now. We want to do it now. But God says, nope, not yet. This is not the best time yet. You see, God's time is always perfect, never too early, never too late. In His time, He will answer your prayers, just in the nick of time, as we say. Wait for God's time. Now, third lesson is this. Align your perspective with God's value system. If you look at verse 15, the angel continues speaking to Zechariah about his son, you know, the John. He will be great in the sight of the Lord. Here in verse 15, the angel prophesied that John the Baptist would be great in God's sight. So great that even Jesus testified to it. In Luke chapter 7, verse 28, he says about John the Baptist, I say to you, among those born of women, there is no one greater than John the Baptist, yet the one who is least in the kingdom of God is greater than he. Now, let's check it out. If you would agree with the angel and agree with Jesus, what they said about John the Baptist, okay? Now, I'm going to compare two individuals here, John the Baptist and King Herod. So who was the greater between the two, may I ask? In view of the world, King Herod was far greater than John the Baptist. He had everything. He was living in the palace. He had power. He had army. He enjoyed all the food he wanted. You see what I'm saying? John the Baptist, however, a solitary man, and dwelling in the wilderness and his clothes is not even, you know, ordinary. He was eating, you know, locusts and wild honey. You see, in the, in the view of the world, King Herod just is the winner with two hands down easily. In God's perspective, however, John was greater than King Herod. Now consider the way John the Baptist died. Very few of us would call it, the way he died, a blessing. In fact, John the Baptist was executed, to be exact, beheaded. Unfairly and with no proper trial, mind you. He was even buried with his head missing. They couldn't locate where his head was. So he was buried 
with no hint. Now, all because of what? One woman's revenge or wrath, if you will, whose name was Herodia. Who was Herodia? She was the queen married to King Herod. But John the Baptist says, you know what the way Herodia married King Herod? was unlawful. In other words, it's against God's will. This is what happened. Herodia originally married to King Herod's brother, Philip. But then, you know, Herodia ditched him and just married again Philip's brother, Herod. And John the Baptist looking at this and he said, nope, 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 that's terribly wrong in the sight of God. And guess what? Herodia grudged against John the Baptist. Who do you think you are? I do whatever I want to do. I'm the queen after all. And that's why you know, John the Baptist lost his head. Anyway, in human ways, John died in a very undignified way. Wouldn't you say? How come? Then God calls him great in his sight. Among those born of women, Jesus says no one was greater than John. Hmm. You see, we need to align our value systems with that of God, not with the world. Are you with me? In the world, John's life was a big failure, even a pity. However, God calls his life a success. And among those born of women, no one was greater than he, Jesus declares. Now, we have two value systems. God's value system versus that of the world. Question is, which value system do you follow? God's or the world's? Let me remind you. In Matthew 5 and Luke chapter 6, Jesus spoke to the multitude. He gave them lesson. We call the Beatitudes. Basically, it's the blessings. And listen to this, what Jesus says in Luke chapter two, uh, 6. Blessed are those who are poor. Who in the world, in the world really, call the poor blessed but God? Blessed are those who are hungry and weep. Really? Blessed are you if people persecute you and hate you on account of my name. Wow. You see, all those things people in the world say, oh no, I don't want to have anything to know. I don't want to go through that. God may think, mm, those are the blessings. If you go through such a tough time, Consider yourself blessed, and I am proud of you. Are you with me? As for closing, I'm going to say this. There was a man who lost his four children in a very tragic boat accident. They all drowned. Would you judge that individual or that incident with the thought, the belief that something must have been wrong with his family? because bad things happen to them? No. Save your judgment until later. Number two, for those who wait for their prayers answered, here is a beautiful and wonderful promise of God. Romans 8, 28. God causes all things, meaning good and bad, to work together for good, to those who love God, to those who are called according to his purpose. If you consider yourself, yes, I am called according to God's purpose, and I am called to love God, here's God's promise. He will make all things beautiful, you know, weaving both good and bad in your life, causes all things to work together for your Right. Commit your way to the Lord, wait for Him, and trust in Him, because He makes all things beautiful once again, according to His promise, in His time. 
Finally, let us learn to use God's standards for success or failure of your life, not the worldly standards. What really matters in your life is whether you fulfill God's purpose and plan in your life. Have you ever thought about that? Therefore, let us learn to look at your life and our life and my life as God does. Do not follow or listen to the worldly values. Just consider the life of John the Baptist. Amen. It's time for joys, concerns, and praises. Let us do the concerns first. Let us continue praying for our nation. Your prayers are needed the most, more than any other times before. So I encourage you this time to join me once again as we have been doing in the past two and a half months. Prayers for our nation. You know the routine. I'll read God's promise by myself first, 2 Chronicles 7, 14, and you will join me when I say, Lord, we pray for, and we are going to pray for our family, youth, and children this time. Okay? If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and heal their land. Lord, we pray for our family, youth, and children, that you will grant them protection of body, soul, mind, and spirit, and fill them with godly desires and true hope, that God's kingdom to come and your will be done in our lives and families. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you. Also, I would appreciate if you continue praying for the uh, complete control and recovery from COVID-19. Also, for the election results still going on to be resolved in peace, law, and order. Let us not lose our focus. You know, that should be fixed on Jesus, our King, not on anybody else. Okay? Also, I would appreciate if you could keep praying uh, for our members and friends who need our prayers for health, finances, and relationships. It's time for joy. I don't have any uh, members' joy to share with you. But today, it's like when I'm recording this session, it's a beautiful, sunny day. I praise God for giving us a wonderful uh, you know, weather to enjoy, and that just perks me up. I'm sure it does it to you too, it's every sunny day. Okay, so let us rejoice and uh, be glad in the day that the Lord has made for us, right? That's my joy. Okay, uh, let us bow as and pray one more time. Lord, we give thanks to you for all the blessings you've bestowed upon us. And many a time we forget to uh, give thanks to you for the blessings. But this is the time as we enter into your throne room in prayer, we bring our thanks to you, Lord, for life we have, the, the health we have, and family we have, jobs we have, friends and the church community we have. There are so many things that we are grateful for. Thank you, Lord, for blessing us with this, such a blessings. Now, it's time for us to lift up our concerns to your attention. I pray that, Lord, you remember our concerns. You already know what we are up against, what, or what we need, too. So, Lord, thank you for listening to our prayers and answering them according to your will and in your time. We do have faith and trust in you, Lord. We pray all these things in your Son's precious name, who taught us to pray, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, 
as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Time for the offerings. Once again, I sincerely thank you from the bottom of my heart for your continued support for God's kingdom work at our church. The most important thing is your prayers. Secondly, you also support God's work through your offerings and tithes. Thank you. And for those who like to send their offerings by online, the information is here. And uh, let us bow as and pray one more time. Lord, we give this offering back to you as a token of our appreciation for your blessings. Help our church to use this offering for your glory and honor without any waste. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Our closing hymn is 234 of the United Methodist Hymnal, O Come, All Ye Faithful. We'll sing the last two verses. the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of our Heavenly Father and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all. Amen.